this thing, it's almost perfect. It is absolutely terrible. This thing, forget about it. Well guys, I'm back after a while not in front of the lens. I've been working behind the scenes on one little project and that is what is surrounding me right now. Low profile coolers. But what really makes a low profile cooler? And I reached out to a bunch of you guys before the holidays and I asked exactly that question. You guys came back saying anything below 60 millimeters. But the problem with that is that there's so many different coolers under 60 millimeters that there was no way I could put that all into one video and still keep it under like an hour long. So I'm gonna be breaking this up into two videos. This is the first one that covers anything under 47 millimeters. These are the teeny tiny boys that are meant for the smallest, most space restricted cases. I guess you could call these like the ultra low profile range. First up is this little guy. It's the $23 ID Cooling IS30, and you guessed it by the name, it's just 30 millimeters high. Placing this next to one of the 47 millimeter coolers that are also in this roundup really puts that into perspective. Otherwise, the downdraft style design, like most of the other coolers in this roundup, it's just that ID Cooling has tried to do that on a much, much more compact scale. I mean, look at this thing. It's so tiny. It's so cute. And then there's the IS40X V2, which is sort of like the IS30's slightly taller and maybe fatter brother. It's a jump upwards in price to about 30 bucks and the height goes to, no, it's not 40 millimeters like you would guess. This is actually a 45 millimeter high cooler. I have to say though, based on the results from the budget cooler roundup that I did a little while ago, you can find that right up here. I have ultra high hopes for pretty much everything from ID Cooling lately. I mean, overall, the 40X feels really, really well built for the price and you've got to love its blackout look. Oh and in case you were wondering the only difference between the original 40X and the V2 version is simply LGA 1700 compatibility. Absolutely nothing else changes. After that is the Iceberg Thermal Ice Flow T65 ITX and yes it's a mouthful that goes for between 35 to 40 bucks. When you first see this thing there doesn't seem to be much hope for it at all. It's got this sort of cheap hunk of extruded aluminum look, but well, the looks are actually deceiving. It's heavy as hell for its size. Flip it over and there's actually three dedicated six millimeter heat pipes along with a really well-finished solid base. So no cheapo HDT here, folks. That's not happening. The only issue with a design like this is there's absolutely no way to replace that fan. If it goes, you're absolutely out of luck. Next up is actually the $45 price point and this seems to be sort of like that sweet spot where a bunch of the coolers in this roundup end up sitting. So here you get the Noctua LH L9A, the Cooler Master Master A G200P RGB, the Thermalrite AXP90 and the ID Cooling IS 47. Okay, of those, the Noctua is actually the slimmest with a height of just 37 millimeters. And it doesn't need much more of an intro either, since let's be honest, this thing's basically become the ubiquitous SFF heatsink that pretty much everybody recognizes and recommends. Just remember, the all black Chromax version actually pushes the price a bit higher. And a lot of the times you're not even gonna see the cooler, so does the Chromax even matter? You gotta ask yourself that. Meanwhile, there's the Master Air G200P, and we gotta talk about this one. Unlike the IS40X, it's actually a mid-priced cooler that just feels cheap, 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 cheap. But you might be asking yourself, why is there a premium here? Well, guess why? It's got RGB, that's about it. That's all it's got going for it. It's the only one here though with that integrated lighting. And even though the lighting can be changed with an external controller, it just feels outdated since if you don't have an RGB header on your motherboard, you need to power this thing with a Molex power connector. This is one of those products that seems like it was designed for systems from a decade ago with only the mounting hardware being updated for current sockets. And the Thermalrite AXP90R sits at this price point right alongside the other ones and in this case, Case, though it's the full copper version. It's one of the higher heat sinks in this roundup at 47 millimeters and guess what it's actually one of the best built too. I mean the copper plating might not be to everyone's liking but this thing just feels like a tank. You should also know that the market's been just flooded with different versions of this cooler but the AXP90R I've got here is basically a clone of the AXP90X47. There's just a small and I mean small variance in heat sink size but more importantly you got to take note the 
the R version for AMD does not come with a backplate like the other versions do. And then there's this. This is the IS-47 from ID Cooling. And yeah, I know it looks like a bare heatsink since the fan is mounted underneath. So that means it draws air in from around the CPU socket area and then it exhausts it upwards instead of blasting hot air towards your motherboard. The last and most expensive cooler here is the Cryorig C7. And I'm putting it at 55 bucks, but actually finding it for that price isn't easy, especially when it comes to the copper edition that I ended up getting. But you get what you pay for in this case, since the C7 is just a thing of beauty. Everything from its fin array to base and mounting kit is pretty much engineered to perfection. The only thing that I'm not too crazy about here is the non-standard fan mounting, so you can't swap it out with something else. But I know that that was a lot of information to take into account, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sort all of these coolers based on height rather than price. So basically at the top, we've got the IS-30, which is a teeny tiny guy of this roundup. And then that goes all the way to that 47 millimeter category where it seems like a lot of the higher end heat sinks are. And with that out of the way, I guess it's time to get on to installation. So I'm gonna sort of like set myself up here for that and I'll be right back. Welcome to the light where wings fly silent and constantly impress with performance. What? The wings of the light have beautiful circular showcase. I'm just here for some fans. This diffusion is unlike anything you've seen before. I mean, I've seen RGB fans before. Yeah, but these are ARGB from Be Quiet. You're saying this is their first RGB fan. Must be good, right? We have 120s, 140s, high speed and standard versions too. There's also the three pack with the hub. That is right. Impress your inner self with the new light wings so you can fly into the Be Quiet light wings. Check them out below. Okay guys, onto the installation. No, I'm not gonna cover every single one of the coolers here, but I do wanna highlight some of the items that you're gonna come across when it comes to installing an ultra low profile cooler in an ITX motherboard. And the simple matter of the fact here is every single one of these manufacturers, I'm gonna have the cameraman come in here so I can talk about this a little bit closer. Every single one of these manufacturers is trying to pack as much cooling potential as possible into the smallest form factor. And what that means is that it, they need to maximize the lateral space without coming into contact with the memory modules, the VRM heatsinks, or anything else on one of these ITX motherboards. And how do they do that? Unfortunately, they expand the space to the point where the standard installation areas, like right here on the AMD system, are blocked. So you can't actually get a screwdriver into there like you normally would on a typical tower cooler. Now, the main problem with that is that installation happens from from the back. And in this kind of situation, what you're gonna have to do to install it is apply your thermal compound and then flip the whole motherboard and CPU cooler over, sort of do this like balancing, the drunken man balancing act here. And then in this case, which is the cryo rig, you're going to wanna completely tighten every single one of the screws on the back plate. Now the ID cooling, there's the major problem that they have is they don't have this back plate to spread that tension all around the motherboard and they only use bolts on four ends. That to me is a no-no. Now the other thing I wanted to mention is the best installation that you can get with all of these coolers. And believe it or not, that is, you're probably gonna flip right now, the iceberg thermal. Now, I'm going to have the camera guy come in again. I feel like Gordon Ramsay here. Pan down, pan down. Anyway, so all you have to do is use the existing AM4 backplate, or if you have an Intel system, you would be using the included Intel backplate. Pop four studs on, put the cooler on, like so, and then there's four screws that you just have to screw in place. Actually, they're bolts that you have to bolt in place. And that's it. This is mwah, chef's kiss. Now, Let's get on to what the worst installation is because I'm calling you out, Cooler Master. Your installation processes are from like another era. It's absolutely terrible. So, Cooler Master here, you can actually see I ordered this myself. This is what you get from Cooler Master. Let's just see. You get a package of goodies that if you've ever built Meccano, this feels like Meccano. You're gonna be swearing and cussing and everything up and down. So let me explain all of this here to you. 
Look at this. There's a little thing that's so important about these coolers. It is a KISS concept. Keep it simple and stupid. This is keep it stupid and stupider. So every single one of these little components you have to sift through. And not only that, a lot of them are extremely breakable plastic. Check that out, Robert. Look at, look at this. This is a little tab that you have to put onto a little back plate that Cooler Master gives you. That back plate, I don't even know where it is anymore. Actually, it might have snapped. I'm not 100% sure. But look at this. There's little pieces. There's big pieces. There's a little screwdriver head. It is absolutely terrible. This thing, forget about it. You never want to use this. This thing could have the performance of a U12S and it costs 10 bucks and I still wouldn't recommend it. Anyways, let's get on to the performance, see how these coolers do. But before I get into the results, I just wanted to reacquaint everybody with the way we handle performance charts for cooler reviews because there's an absolute ton of information on every single one of these. Here, the Y axis is showing the CPU temperature in degrees Celsius, while the X axis shows how noisy each cooler gets in decibels. This effectively shows how hot these coolers allow the CPU to get relative to the amount of noise they produce. So the best coolers here will have the lowest temperatures at the lowest possible noise levels. I'll also be testing at two different thermal outputs. That would be 65 watts and 95 watts, which should cover the vast majority of processors you'll actually want to use with these ultra small coolers. So with that being said, right away at 65 watts, you're going to see a clear trend here. The shorter coolers like the IS30 and G200P are in a very, very different performance category than higher and more expensive options like the Thermalrite and Cryorig. There are though two nice surprises. First up is the T65 from Iceberg Thermal, which I think offers a really good balance of height, performance and pricing. Then there's the IS40X V2, which ends up being pretty mind blowing when you realize it costs a whole $20 less than the coolers it ends up competing against. But the IS47K, this thing's design ends up completely kneecapping it. And by this point already, you might be thinking that height might correlate to performance, but there's one thing that you haven't taken into account yet, and that is this little guy the Noctua L9A. And where does this thing end up being in our charts? Well, it's not here because you might think it would be. It's not there. This is actually where it lands. One of the slimmest coolers in this whole roundup ends up competing with some of the thickest ones. Now, if we zoom in on the 38 decibel range and add a stock AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler, things become a bit clearer and it's easier to separate the men from the boys. A lot of these coolers actually struggle to beat a stock heatsink since they're designed for compactness rather than performance. But moving on to 95 watts, and it's a bit of a disaster top to bottom with the IS30, T65, G200P, and IS47K all failing to get below our 90 degree threshold. Then there were a few, I guess you would call them minor successes with the C7 and IS40X going below throttling temperature, but at much higher noise levels. And the most impressive results were for, you guessed it, the Noctua and Thermalrite. I mean, I wouldn't really use either of them if you're gonna be running a 95 watt or higher modern CPU at full load all the time but it's good to see they do have some headroom where the others simply don't. But I also wanted to add a little bit of realism into this. Look, our CPU cooler benchmarks are made to show the absolute worst case scenario. But at the same time, I don't think that in this market, when somebody's buying one of these coolers, that they are typically going to expect it to get pounded, pounded, pounded by an all core heavy workload all day, every day. So it's because of that, we're going to add some gaming cooling results to this. We're gonna keep it all at 95 watts, but I think this is a little bit more realistic scenario that these coolers are gonna find themselves in in an ITX PC. Basically, the gap between the IS30 and G200P has now widened to a massive amount, but that doesn't mean that the G200P is actually getting good results. And the IS47K, guess what? It's struggling here too, since its fan can't produce enough static pressure to push fresh air through that dense fin array when the air itself within the case is quite warm. And of course, the best from the last tests 
keep on being the best here too, with that Noctua delivering some really mind-blowing results. And narrowing that down to the 38 decibel sweet spot, again, shows how much things change under these different types of load conditions. Instead of a bunch of failures, the overall results are pretty decent right across the board. So those gaming results, they were sort of like that first dose of realism, but I wanted to hit you with one more dose. And it really has to do with where these CPU coolers will typically find themselves on a daily basis in your systems. Now, these are absolutely geared towards the small form factor market. But in order to standardize testing here, what we end up doing is we use our standard CPU cooler test system on all of these. That way we can compare one of these eventually to a tower style cooler and so on. But what that means is that they were used in what's probably an optimal scenario. It's an ATX case that has relatively good airflow. But what happens when we put them into this? I'm just gonna reach off screen here. Ah, this is the NR200. Yes, it is one of the larger small form factor cases out there on the market, but I wanted to retest all of these in a little bit more confined environment to see what actually happens. And the results, those are interesting because when compared to our standard results, every single one of the coolers, of course, sees a massive jump in temperatures with some being a lot more drastic than others. I mean, the IS30 alone sees a 12 degree jump when being put into an ITX case. But what about gaming? And I was pleasantly surprised in some cases. Even though I wouldn't touch the IS47K, IS30, or the G200P with a 10 foot pole here, the rest provided temperatures that range from decent, I guess, to impressive with the usual suspects leading the way. So I guess that pretty much rounds things up, but what roundup wouldn't be complete without some recommendations and fails? So there's a couple of fails here. First and foremost, this might not be a failure of their own making, but the IS30 and the IS47K are not the greatest coolers out there when taken into a typical scenario. On the other hand, they are built for very, very specific use cases. But what isn't built for a specific use case is the Cooler Master G200P. This thing is simply hot garbage. It is overpriced, underperforming, and the only reason you're paying a premium for it is this RGB fan. Not only that, its mounting hardware is absolute positive trash. There are so many better heat sinks on the market versus this. Now, if I had a couple of value picks to make, that's a little bit harder in this roundup just because of the fact that there isn't a massive price difference between a lot of the coolers. But I do have to give the Iceberg Thermal T65 a shout out here. It is a solid middle of the pack performer, but if you're new into the ITX market and you've got all these other frustrations of cable management and everything else, the last thing you want is to be fighting with a cooler installation. Then there's also the IS40X. Right across the board at lower heat loads, this thing performed very, very well for its $30 asking price. But if there's one cooler, the god of ultra low profile coolers, it has to be this guy. This thing, it's almost perfect. The Noctua L9A is basically everything you could possibly want in a low profile cooler. It's small, it combines cooling, height, ease of installation, engineering, everything that you can imagine into one compact design that's just freaking kick ass. Not only that, is if you have a case that supports it, the NAFD1 that I reviewed recently, it can actually boost performance of this by a pretty significant amount. So there you have it. This is ultra low profile coolers complete. I'm gonna be moving on to the low profile coolers really, really soon. If there's anything else you wanna see maybe in that roundup, please leave a comment below. I hope you love this video. I'm gonna see you guys in the next one.